Okay, I want to speak to us this morning on the topic, the interim presence of God. The interim presence of God. And I'm sure we all know what interim means. Interim is short-lived, it's temporary, it's not lasting. That's what interim is. So when God gave me this word, I woke up, I'm like, what do you mean, Lord? What do you mean by the interim presence of God? I began to interrogate him because I understand, you know, what interim means. So I started interrogating God. What do you mean your, the, your, your presence is short-lived or not permanent? Or what are you saying? And God began to speak to me. He said, even though I have made the promise to be with you, even though I have given you my word, despite this promise, your actions will be the determining factor if my presence will stay with you. So your actions, you, the onus to sustain my presence, to keep my presence is on you. So even though I have given this word, my presence, despite the promise, despite the promise, can be short-lived. Based on your actions. Based on the things you do or the things you do not do. Even though I have given my word. Because there is a role for you to also play, even though I have made a promise to you. You also have a role to play. And that is why it is the interim presence of God. So your actions are what determines if the presence of God will remain with you or the presence of God will depart from you. Let's open our Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 13. 1 Samuel 20 and verse 13. Now we all know, um, background of the story, Saul has been seeking to kill David, you know. He got envious of David. He saw grace. He saw glory. And David never offended him. Sometimes so you begin to wonder, why do people hate me? I've not done anything to her. I've not done anything to him. It's not because of what you did or what you didn't do. There is something they've seen. They've seen glory. And they're envious of the glory. I'm a living witness. And I'm sure a lot of you can testify to that. You'll be wondering, what have I done to this person? Nothing. But there is something they've seen that they can't even explain. And that thing makes them envy you. They want to have it. And because they don't have it, they just are projecting envy and hatred. This was the case of Saul. Because David did nothing to him. But he just saw the glory that David carried. He saw the grace upon David. And he began to envy and hate on David. Anyway, so this was the story. And we, in this text, you know, Jonathan was here speaking to David, expressing and declaring his commitment to David, his loyalty to David, his allegiance to David. He was telling David, David, I've got you. Yes, I may be related to my father by blood. We may have this, we may share the same DNA, but I am committed to you. My allegiance is to you. My loyalty is to you. Relax. I've got your back, David. I will not be alive. I will not be here and let anything bad or any harm come to you. Don't worry, let me go source my father out. Let me go investigate him. Let me go weigh him. If his mind towards you is still evil, David, I will tell you. I will let you know. I am here to cover you. And my prayer for you is that God will give you such friends that will be closer, that will stick closer to you than even brothers, than even blood relatives. People that will put their neck, stick their neck on the line for you to succeed, for you to excel. People that will not envy what God is doing for you and doing through you. People that will go extra mile to see you prosper and be all that God has called you to be in Jesus' name. Such was Jonathan's friendship with David. Even though he was, he was supposed to be like maybe heir apparent. His father is king. So David, David's, um, you know, uh, anointing was supposed to be a threat to Jonathan. But it wasn't. He still loved David in spite of. He still loved David nevertheless. And he still, he wanted the best for David. May God bring people to you that would want the best for you in the name of Jesus. So 1 Samuel 20 and verse 13, Jonathan says to David, let me go source my father out. Let me go weigh his mind. If he's angry and wants to, you killed, I'm reading from the NLT. May the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so you can escape and leave. But in this text, he said something very remarkable. He said, may the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father. The key word in this text is, as he used to be. That is past tense. He said, may the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father. Now, the CEB translation puts it this way. Come on, English Bible. He says, may the Lord be with you as he once, as he once was with my father. This is not a good testimony, fam. This is not a good testimony. And may this testimony not be yours in the name of Jesus. But beyond prayer, 
Beyond praying that this testimony will not be yours. Action is required. Action is demanded of you in order for this testimony not to be yours. Now, in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5, God made the same statement to Joshua. God said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. But there's a difference in these two statements. One was dead. And one was still very much alive. So if Jonathan had used this statement and his father was dead, it would have been very appropriate. It would have been so appropriate. But he used this statement whilst his father is still very much alive. So he could see that God was no longer with his father. He could perceive the absence of God in the life of his father. He could tell that the glory had departed. He could tell that his father was just an empty vessel. He could tell that right now there is no king in the palace anymore. There is a clown in the palace. He said, let God be with you as he used to be. If God was still with his father, he said, may God be with you as he is with my father. Because his father is still very much alive. But his father, his, hmm, ah, yeah, Kanda, may that not be your testimony. May your yesterday never be better than your today. May your yesterday never be better than your tomorrow. In the name of Jesus. As simple as that prayer is, it is so powerful. Because in the life of Saul, what he says is that his yesterday was better than his today. He said, may God be with you as he used to be with my father. His own son could see that God was no longer with him. His own son. He could see that God had left him. And he could refer to the presence of God in his father's life in past tense. He could see that every testimony or story that Saul told was in the yesterday. There were no more new encounters. There were no more new experiences. There was nothing new that God was doing in the life of Saul because the glory had gone. He was surviving and living on yesterday's glory. He was surviving and living on yesterday's praise and yesterday's victory. The accomplishments and the wins he won for Israel of yesterday, five years ago, that was the glory he was walking and glowing in. There was no present victory. There was no present glory. There was no new honor. He was just walking in yesterday's honor. The son could perceive it. He knew that hm, this is gone. There is nothing there anymore. He's just passing time. So David, you are just, he, just hold on until he finished passing time. Because we cannot kill him. Even though we know that the glory is no longer there, we can't kill him. Let him just pass time until God takes him out. He could tell that that was just an empty vessel sitting there in the palace. Empty vessel. And we have seen this play out in the lives of many men of God, if we are going to be honest with ourselves. We have seen this play out in the lives of even believers. They will tell you how God used them 20 years ago to raise the dead. How God used them 15 years ago to heal the sick, the blind, all the eyes open, the deaf could hear, the lame could walk. How God used them five years ago. How their prayer lives were so vibrant five years ago. How they could pray for hours five years ago. How, they could, how their visions were so accurate and their prophecies were so accurate. How God used them, but it's all in the past. They could tell you how their prayer altars burned and burned and burned and burned. But it's all in the past. The glory has departed. Ichabod is now in full operation. No new encounter. Nothing new. God said this yesterday. God told me this five years ago. God told me that. But what is God still, what is God saying now? He said so five years ago, we agree. He said so ten years ago. In fact, he said so yesterday. But what is he saying today? They boast so much in the glory of yesterday, in the winds of yesterday, that they've lost sight of the emptiness of today. They've lost sight of the emptiness of the present. The Bible says in Hosea, Hosea, I think 7 verse 9, it says, strangers have devoured your strength. They have sapped your strength and you do not know. They don't know that they are just empty vessels sitting there. Keeping up appearance, facade, fake life. Faking it until they, because you can't say fake it until you make it. So they are faking it until their time comes to an end. And that is why you see people, they go to fetish means to still maintain that reputation. Because they know that the glory has departed. But instead of them to stay in the place of prayer to build it back, instead of them to stay in the place of prayer to fan the flame back to fire, they began to seek other mediums just to keep up appearance. So it, so it does not show that the glory has indeed departed, but they know that the glory has departed. But to keep up appearance, they begin to seek other mediums. May the Lord help us. The question is, what can bring a man down to such low estate? 
What can bring a man to such a level of degradation? A man, somebody, a, a life that once glowed in the glory of God, that once walked in God's honor, that once enjoyed God's presence. What can make that same life to now lose glory? What can make that same life to now walk in emptiness and become powerless? Powerless. The life that glowed in glory. What happened? How did the glory just disappear and vanish? What can bring that man to that level to lack ability to express God's power? What can bring that man to that level? What could make a king become a clown in the palace? What could make a king become a clown? How did he get to that point? First Samuel chapter 13. And verse 13 to 14. First Samuel 13, verse 13 to 14. The Bible says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now, the Lord would have established Israel. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Disobedience. He disobeyed God's commandments. He grieved the Lord. He grieved the spirit of God. And what's worse in this matter is, even though he knew God was angry, because someone has, has told him now, we've all read it here, we've heard, he told him that God is angry. He, in fact, he even told him the repercussion of his actions. But Saul was not repentant. Saul was not sorry. He did not bother Saul. He carried on as if nothing happened. If you read, we don't have time, go home and study it. If you read, you know, the, the, the preceding verses, see that after, after Samuel finished speaking and walked away, Saul took his men. Let's go. Like nothing happened. He treated God's words or God's verdict or judgment with so much ignominy. It didn't bother him. He felt, after all, I was in my own. I was on my own. I was not royalty and God called me. So God needs me. He called me and made me king. I was from the smallest family, the smallest clan, the smallest community. So God needs me. If God could pick me out of everyone in Israel, come on, there's something about me. Some of you don't know what you're saying. There's something about me. There's something that God needs in me. So he felt he was doing God a favor. I'm doing you a favor by being king over Israel. So you need me. So he was so arrogant. He was so proud. He was nonchalant about God's anger or God's verdict. He was unrepentant. He was not sorry. Because it takes humility to be sorry. It takes humility to repent and to say, Lord, I am sorry. In fact, to even tell your fellow human, I am sorry, it takes humility. Because when you say, I am sorry, you are deferring. When you apologize, you are deferring. You are agreeing that, yes, you are wrong. So you are deferring. So he, he, he was too big, too arrogant to defer. He did not have that. God, you need me. Yeah? And he walked away. <laughs> but God is a just God. God is a just God. God gave Saul another chance. Because God never leaves himself without a witness. He is a just judge of the universe. And he's earned that name. Even though he says, I will do this to you. I will do that to you. He will still give an opportunity to redeem yourself. So when he comes, because in as much as he is the refining fire and the reviving fire is also the consuming fire. So when he comes in the consuming fire mode, you will know that he gave enough chances. So in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God gives, um, um, what is his name, Saul, another opportunity, another chance to redeem himself. He sends Samuel, the same Samuel, not someone else, back to Saul with specific instructions. The instructions were not vague. They were very specific and clear that there is no way anyone with the right senses would miss it. First Samuel chapter 15. I wish we had time to go through this. This is a very interesting and powerful story. Let's go to verse 10 and 11 and verse 18 to 19. So First Samuel 15. He says, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me. This is God speaking. Please can I have that water? For he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Water break. Scripture says he was so deeply moved that he cried out to the Lord all night. Now the Lord sends, verse 18 now, 
Now the Lord sent you. So this is Samuel telling him what, what he's done again this time. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. If, I'm sure we are conversant with this story if you're, Bible, if you're a Bible scholar. He said, kill everything, man and beast. But our beloved Saul killed everything. And he looked, he said, ah, I don't think God understands how beautiful this is. Ah. No, 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 no. God is in heaven. He does not understand. He could not feel it. God, I am touching it. I'm feeling it. This is, this is too good to kill. Uh, uh, how can I? Ah, uh, God. How can I kill this now? Then he looked at the king. Look at the crown. Ah. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Oh, I didn't even see this cow. What? Look at the milk. He said, God doesn't understand. He took, the Bible says, he took all the choicest things. The things that were nice, that were fat, that were healthy. He took them. But God said, utterly destroy everything. He killed everything. The only person he, he spared in that land was the king. But you know, with God, when it comes to obedience, you cannot give him 99.9. .9. You cannot give God 99.9 .9 obedience. That is disobedience. So you cannot say, God, I did this, but I did not complete it. He needs complete and total obedience from you and from me. So Saul failed yet again. Verse 19, he says, why then did, did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Yet again, yet again, Saul proved to be a bastard. Why do I say so? Romans 8, 14. The Bible says that they who are led by the Spirit of God, they who are led, when you are led, then it means you must be a follower. You are following who is leading you. Whoever is leading you is ahead of you and you are following. Whether the path is narrow, whether the path is thorny, whether it is straight, whether it is beautiful, whether it looks as if it is the right track for where you are heading, but you are following in spite of, it may not look like where you are going at all. In Exodus 16, the Bible tells us, digressing just a little bit, God told Moses and the people, do not go, when you are leaving Egypt, do not go through the usual route. Don't go through the main road, the normal place that you would have taken. Go through the place I am telling you to go through. A different route entirely. They got there, they were before the Red Sea. They were like, oh my God, oh my God. So it may look like where you are heading to, there is a Red Sea ahead. It may look like where you are heading to, there is destruction ahead. But as long as God is the one leading you, he knows how to make a way. So Saul did not follow God. He proved to be a bastard because they who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the ones who are the sons of God. So Saul was saying to God, I am not your son. I know better than you. I know more than you. First time he disobeyed, he refused to be led. Second time he disobeyed, God gave him another opportunity. He disobeyed. I don't know who God is speaking to this morning. Who God has given a second chance in this place this morning. I don't know who God is saying, I am giving you a second chance. I am giving you an opportunity to redeem yourself. I don't know who God is speaking. That I said I'm going to be with you, that my prince will be with you. It's not a guarantee that my prince will be with you, depending on what you do and what you do not do. You have the power to keep my presence with you. You have the power to grieve my presence, my presence to walk away and step aside and leave you. So I don't know who God is speaking to. It is not just about me making declarations and praying and saying, yes, God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. Are you sure God is with me? Are you sure he's with you? Have you made the place comfortable and conducive enough to host the presence of God by your actions? That is why it's called the interim presence of God. The interim. So when it looks like you're not seeing God in the things you do, in the works of your hands, in your business, in your family, it is time for you to look introspectly. I hope that English is correct. And say, God, I hope I have not gotten it wrong. It is not God. He's not a man to lie. He cannot lie. There are two immutable things. God cannot lie. So if something is wrong, it is not from God. It is from me. It is from you. Look within. Look within. God is giving someone an opportunity to redeem themselves in this house this morning. God is presenting to someone a second chance. And perhaps you, you are, all the boxes are ticked right. God is telling you, okay, these are the things that can make my presence become interim in your life. So walk in obedience.
if there's any instruction, if there's any instruction that God has given someone here in the house, if there's anything that God is laying in your heart to do, no matter how stupid and illogical it is, do. If you want to see the hand of God. For they who are led, they who follow, it takes obedience to be led. It takes humility to be led. It takes trust to be led. Saul did not trust God. When you disobey God, you are telling God, I don't trust you enough. That is what you are saying. That's why there are always repercussions. Why was Abraham called righteous? Because he believed. That was the only reason Abraham has been called righteous. Because he believed. You cannot believe without trust. You must trust. I must trust you to believe you. So when I don't believe, it means I don't trust you. So Saul was saying to God over and over again, I don't trust your judgment. I don't trust your judgment. I don't trust your judgment. God says, you are not my son. Your actions can make you a bastard or a son. As cruel as it sounds, your actions can make you a bastard or a son. So Saul proved himself again to be a bastard. And a lifelong promise became short-lived. Because the same promise that God made to David, that he was going to give him an everlasting dynasty, was the same plan he had for Saul. In other words, whoever was going to be king, God had this massive plan for that person. Hmm. There is always a plan B. God always has plan B waiting. But it takes how you behave. It takes how you walk with God justly. How you re respond to the things of God. Maybe your plan B would wait forever or would be sent on a different assignment. But there's always a plan B. No one is indispensable. The first time around in 1 Samuel 20, God told Saul, I have, I've chosen another man. Second time, he said, okay, let me, let me see. Maybe I, I will send that man somewhere else. Let me see if you will redeem yourself. He told him again, I have another man. There is always another man in the mind of God for everything he has called you to do. Because he's giving you the power of choice. You have willpower. So if you refuse to do it, if he calls you and you refuse to pick the call, if he sends you on an errand and you refuse to go, there is someone else there that he's waiting. That he's waiting. I've, I've told this story some time ago. I was in a, in, a, in a Christian gathering and the presence of God was so awesome and that was my first time there and I had this mighty unction to prophesy but I was like, oh my God, they don't even know me here. Oh my God, this is my... I, I refused. I was holding myself. I was struggling and struggling for over 15 minutes and all of a sudden somebody be began to prophesy and God said, that's what I wanted you to say. Nobody, no matter how anointed you are, is indispensable. Nobody. Nobody. That is why he says, if you refuse to praise me, I will raise stones. So you are not doing me any favor. You are not doing me any favor. You are doing yourself the favor. By serving me, you are doing yourself the favor. By walking in righteousness, in holiness, in obedience, you are doing yourself the favor. You are not doing me any favor. I am God. I can command anything and everything to work for me. I am God. I don't lack armies. He wanted to fight against Israel. What did he use? Stars, 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 stars. Cosmic armies. God has armies everywhere. Everywhere. On that time, what did he use? Hailstones. God can use anything and anyone. Anything and anyone. So Saul made an eternal promise to become so short-lived. The departure of or the absence of God's presence in one's life can make a lifelong promise become as short-lived as even a week or a month. A lifelong promise can become a week's promise or a month's promise. Depending on your response, your obedience, your actions or your, or your inactions. Hallelujah. As I round up, let's quickly look at the story of Samson, John, Judges chapter 16. Now, before this guy was born, there were strict instructions that his life should be guided by. We all know his story. There were things that he should do and not do, eat and not eat. One of the instructions were never to cut his hair. But you see Samson, if, we, if, you, if you are conversant with his story and familiar with his story, you will see Samson break these rules one after the other. One after the other. Until he broke the one that was a straw that broke the camel's back. Judges 16. The Bible says here in verse 20. 
And she said, so this was after his hair had been cut. The Bible says, and she said, the Philistines are upon you. <laughs> the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before, as at other times, and I will shake myself free. Nothing can hold me down. Nothing can hold me bound. I am Samson. God is with me. I carry the spirit of God. With my bare hands, I devoured the lion. With my bare hands, I uprooted the city's gate. Ah, uh -uh. Don't they know who I am? Go and ask. I've got track record. So he said, I will get up as at other times. I will get up like yesterday. <laughs> May your yesterday never be better than your today in the name of Jesus. Like yesterday, I will get up. And the Bible says here, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He did not know. God can depart from a man. The presence of God can leave a man. The presence of God can leave a man. He did not know. Ah, shatali bado shandari abada sin day. When the presence of God leaves a man, it does not leave a man instantly. It is only one day you realize he's gone. He has been stepping away gradually. For each action of disobedience, each, each action of negligence and carelessness and complacency, the presence of God was getting colder and colder in his life. He didn't know. When you fix the iron, and you take it off after iron, it does not get cold immediately. It's still hot. It's still warm. So sometimes people walk thinking they still carry the fire, but there is no fire. They walk thinking they still carry the presence, but there is no presence. Because it's not just manifest instantly. It's so easy to walk firelessly and think you still carry fire. Because you will not disappear instantly. It's only when it gets to that point where you really need that manifestation. And you realize it's gone. Is gone. You shake, shake, shake. You speak all the tongues. It's empty. Because as we walk in the Lord, we now get used to our tongues. It becomes our dialect. Because it's our spiritual dialect. So we speak it, but it lacks the power and the essence. You are just nothing. Because it's the power of the Holy Ghost that makes what we say to become effective and do signs and wonders. Without the power of the Holy Ghost, we are just speaking gibberish. So he got up and there was nothing. Nothing. Why? The presence of God had left him. The presence of God had departed. There was no more glory. There was no more honor. This once revered Samson became an object of caricature. That is what the lack of God's presence can do in the life of a man. Where one, a man was once revered and respected and honored, Samuel said to the people, nobody must sit down, nobody must eat, nobody must touch anything until Saul comes in. The one time revered and respected Saul became a, 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 an object of caricature in the palace. They would say, oh my God, there's somebody that knows how to play the flute. Go call him, go call him, go call him. Let's see if this demon will calm down. And the cooks and everybody will be chatting and gossiping and making jest of him. Did you see what the king did today? Did you see how he walked naked? You know, he, he became an object of caricature. Samson became an object of caricature. Despite the, 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 the amount, the, the, the level of the presence of God that he commanded and carried. Everyone revered and feared him. In one of the texts, they were plotting evil against him and saying, you know what, in the morning we'll deal with him. He said, why wait till morning? Why wait till morning when I can deal with you right now? He got up at night, he went and removed the city's gates. That was how powerful he was. But not knowing that his actions were killing the spirit of God in him. Why do you think the Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit? When you grieve the spirit of God, he walks away. When you grieve the spirit of God, he pokes you. He wants you. He corrects you. He chastises you. But when you refuse to take correction, he begins to walk away. He begins to walk away. Because it's only they who are led by the spirit are the sons of God. He realizes that this is no son. This is no son. The sins that the Bible records of David in the scriptures... <laughs> if you put David's sins and you put Saul's sins, the sins of David will swallow up Saul's sins. You can't even compare. All the things we are saying, you can't compare. The sins of David will swallow up every one of Saul's sins. But what was the difference between these two men? David was very repentant. David always came back to say, Lord, I am sorry. 
In sin did my mother conceive me as if God was under the nature of man is sin. He's now trying to explain to God in sin. This nature, this flesh, this flesh is sin. God, this flesh, ah, you know my weakness, you know my frame. As if it's not God that created the frame and created man out of dust. He will start to explain. I am sorry. God, it is this world. This world is evil. That's why I said, take me home. You refuse. To Lord, he would always go back. But he will not go to cajole God. He would never go to take God's mercy for granted. Yes, I am weak. I cannot control my flesh. That is my weakness. But Lord, I am sorry. He was always going back to God to say, Father, I am sorry. He understood the power, not just the power, the value of the presence of God. He said, cast me not away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. I can afford to lose anything. I can afford to lose the kingdom. I can afford to lose the crown. I can afford to lose the people. But I can never afford to lose you. And that was what Saul did not understand. Saul was so reputationally conscious. He wanted to be in the right side of the people at all times. In his two disobedience or two sins, it was all the people, the people, the people. He cared so much about what the people said. He cared so much about what the people thought of him. He always wanted to please the people. But David never cared about what the people thought about him. He didn't care if he made a mess or a fool of himself in the presence of the people. He didn't care if he lost anything or anyone. There was nothing that was so valuable to David that he felt, I cannot lose this. He felt, I can lose everything as long as I don't lose the presence of God. Because his presence comes with the kingdom. His presence comes with the people. His presence comes with riches. His presence comes with healing. His presence comes with peace. It is a package. There is no way you will, the presence of God will be with you that you won't experience all these things. In his presence is fullness. In his presence, mountains, they melt like wax. Is it what, what sort of battle is contending with you? confronting you, challenging you. In his presence, they fail. They may fight for a while. But the Bible says, why do you think he said Psalm 110? He says, sit on, at my right hand until how bashat are you? Until I make your enemies your foes. He says, sit. That means don't leave my side. Stay connected. Stay with me. Do not leave me. There is a time that will come that all these enemies you see flexing muscles here and there, they will become your footstool. But the thing is, you have to stay connected. You have to stay with me. It's a package deal. The healing you are looking for, the prosperity, the promotions, the open doors, the breakthrough, fruitfulness, whatever it is, connections, they are all in his presence. But Saul lacked that understanding. He was trying to secure the kingdom. He was trying to secure the people. He was trying to secure the crown outside the presence. Therefore, he lost everything. But David said, I'd rather lose everything than to lose you. Because if I have you, I have everything. Everything I want is in you. <sighs> Can we rise to our feet? I don't know how this word has ministered to you. But I want you to begin to speak. If there's any place you need to say, Lord, I am sorry. I don't want your presence to be interim in my life. I don't want your promises to be interim in my life. I don't want it to be short-lived. Everything that you are power laid on her, everything you have prepared and planned for me, oh God, I don't want it to be short-lived, oh God. In any way, oh God, I have grieved you out around to now saying the end of the seat. Mercy, 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 mercy. Ah, riba babo shanda liya bada zie tala da yosa. Rakanda raba raba de bado zondo liya nda na na kande lento no mono zonde. Ah, shata liba tadi bada sonta na mana ya kande ye. Ah, sete leto no sata ya. I can afford to lose everything and anything of God, but let it not be your presence. Let it not be your presence, oh God. Let your presence not be interim in my life. Let it not be short lived, oh God. I can't afford to lose your presence. I can't afford to lose you. Azata leto na shata raba baba yada bale soto na yasa. I can't afford to lose you. Somebody say you can't afford to lose his presence. The glory you want, the favor you want, the connections you want, the lifting you want, the joy you want. They are all in his presence. They are all in his presence. They are all in his presence. Ah shata liba roba ye. Take not your Holy Spirit away from me, O God. Take not your Holy Spirit away from me, O oh God. The joy I seek is in your presence. The peace I clamor for, I hunger for, I pine for it's your presence. 
the healing I so desire, the restoration, the fire is in your presence. Ah, by take not your presence away from me, oh God. Take not your Holy Spirit away from me, oh God. Ah, Bali Bayota, let it not become short lived. Higher Bali Bayada da 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 da. Ezen de lentona, a shandalintana, a yanda natona, a santa netenea. Take it not away from me. Take it not away from me. Ah, Bali Balo Kondo Zonde, Shende Riba Sana Manakande, Zande Renzo Nomono Zonda, Ita Labashanda. Speak to God, somebody. Speak to him, speak to him, speak to him. I believe you've had the message in a way, oh God, that, that is unique to you. Speak to him in that way. I don't know how it resonates with you. I don't know how it has met you. You know, you know, you know. One minute, speak to him. Hey. We bless your name, Jesus. 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 Hmm. Father, where we need correction, we are open to correction. Father, we are open to correction. We are open to reproofing. For it is only those you love that you chastise. Restore us again if there's any way we have missed it and fallen away, O oh God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Abba Father. Help us, O oh God, that our greatest work with you will not be in our yesterday. In the name of Jesus. I want more of you. Oh, I want more of you, Jesus. The more I know you, the more I want to know you, Jesus. More of you. Hey, yeah. I want more of you, Holy Spirit. Declare to him this morning. I want more of you. Oh, oh, oh. I want more of you. I want more of you. Jesus. The more I know you. for more of you. We want to experience and glow in your presence this year, this season. We want your presence to be evident in our lives, Lord. Whatever it is that we will do that would cause your presence to depart, Father, we ask you that you help us not to do. The Bible says of Abimelech that you held him not to sin. Help us, O oh God. Hold us, O oh God. That we will not be the instruments of our own destruction. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Somebody praise the name of the Lord. Let's invite the choir to take us in our 